e to the power of i times pi plus 1 is equal to 0. Euler's identity is one of the most famous equations in math because it links five fundamental mathematical constants 0, 1, pi, the imaginary unit i, and the Euler's number. At first glance, this equation might seem strange or hard to understand, because how does an irrational number raised to the power of another irrational number multiplied by i results in minus 1? And what does it even mean to raise a number to an imaginary power? Let's start with pi. Pi is a well-known constant in geometry, representing the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter. It is equal to around 3.14. Pi is also important in measuring angles. There are two main ways to measure angles, degrees and radians. In degrees, a full circle is 360 degrees, but in radians, a full circle is measured as 2 pi radians. For example, sine of 90 degrees is equal to sine of pi over 2 radians, which is equal to 1. In fields like calculus and advanced mathematics, angles are usually measured in radians, not degrees, and we usually don't write rad for radians. So if an angle is written without a unit, we assume it is in radians. Radians are easier to use because when we have a circle of radius equal to 1, the length of an arc is equal to the angle it subtends measured in radians. Now let's talk about i. Consider the equation x squared plus 1 is equal to 0. If we rearrange it, we get x squared equal to minus 1. There is no real number that when squared gives a negative result. This is where the complex numbers come in. We define i as the number which when squared equals minus 1. With i we can find square roots of other negative numbers. For example, the square root of minus 9 is 3i, because 3i squared is equal to minus 9. When we multiply i by itself repeatedly, it creates a cyclic pattern. i, minus 1, minus i, 1, and again i. To understand Euler's identity and the number e, we first need to know about derivatives. The derivative describes the rate of change of a function at any given point. Let's look at a graph of a function x cubed minus 2x squared minus 3x plus 3. At x equal to minus 2, this function increases rapidly, but as x approaches about minus 0.4, the increase slows down, the growth rate goes to 0, and after this point, the function starts to decrease. That's what a derivative measures. The value of the derivative at any point is also equal to the slope of the line tangent to the graph of the function at that point. The derivative of the function f is denoted as f prime or as d over dx. To calculate the derivative, let's start with calculating the slope of the line going through two points. Suppose we pick two points on the graph, at x equal to a and x equal to b. Their y coordinates are respectively f of a and f of b, so the height difference between those two points is equal to f of b minus f of a. The horizontal distance between these points is equal to b minus a. Let's call that length h. Now we also can write f of b as f of a plus h. The slope of the line going through those two points is equal to f of a plus h minus f of a divided by h. This formula would give us the average rate of change between points a and b but a derivative describes the rate of change at a single point, not over an interval. So to calculate the slope of the tangent line at point A, we just have to make h very small. As h gets closer and closer to 0, b gets closer and closer to a. So to calculate the slope of a tangent line at point A, we just have to take a limit as h approaches 0. And exactly that is a definition of the derivative. To see how it works, let's look at a simpler function. For example, f of x equals x squared. Let's calculate the derivative of this function at point a equal to 2. From the definition of a derivative, f prime of 2 is the limit as h approaches 0 of f of 2 plus h minus f of 2 divided by h. That is equal to the limit of 4 plus 4h plus h squared minus 4 divided by h. And after simplifying, that is equal to 4 plus h. As h approaches 0, this is just equal to 4, so the value of the derivative at a equal to 2 is 4, but we can find a general formula for the derivative of this function. To do this, we calculate the f prime of x instead of 2. After simplifying, we get that f prime is just equal to 2x, so the derivative of f of x equals x squared at any point x is just equal to 2x. Calculating derivatives doesn't always require using the definition. There are some rules and shortcuts that can make it easier. 
the constant rule tells us that the derivative of a function multiplied by a constant is equal to the derivative of that function multiplied by that constant. For example, the derivative of x squared is 2x, so the derivative of 3 times x squared will be equal to 3 times 2x. The sum rule tells us that the derivative of a function that is a sum of functions f and g is the sum of the derivatives of those functions. The last rule that we will need to understand Euler's identity is the power rule. This rule tells us that if we have a function that is of form x to the power of a, the derivative of that function is equal to a times x to the power of a minus 1. For example, the derivative of x to the power of 4 is equal to 4 times x cubed. Finding derivatives for some functions like sine of x requires a bit more work than just using those rules. We have to go back to the definition of a derivative. From the definition, the derivative of sine of x is the limit as h approaches 0 of sine of x plus h minus sine of x divided by h. We can use a trigonometric identity to expand sine of x plus h into sine of x times cosine of h plus cosine of x times sine of h. Then we divide this expression into two parts. From the first fraction, we can factor out sine of x. From the second fraction, we can factor out cosine of x. Let's first see what happens to the sine of h over h as h approaches 0. Imagine a circle with a radius of 1 and an angle of h radians. The length of the arc created by this angle is also h. The line perpendicular to the radius is equal to the sine of h. As h gets smaller and smaller, the sine of h gets closer and closer to the arc. So the sine of h divided by h gets closer to 1. So we know that the limit as h approaches 0 of sine of h divided by h is equal to 1. Knowing this, we can calculate the second part of the limit. Let's square both sides. Next, we can use a trigonometric identity to write sine of h squared as 1 minus cosine of h squared. We can write it as two separate fractions and we can consider them as two separate limits. Now we divide both sides by the second limit. If we rearrange, the right side is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of h divided by 1 plus cosine of h. When we plug in 0 for h, we find that the right side is equal to 0. Now we multiply both sides by minus 1, and we get that the limit as h approaches 0 of cosine of h minus 1 divided by h is equal to 0. So the derivative of sine of x is equal to the cosine of x. We can do the same thing for cosine but we would get a minus sign instead of plus sign. So the derivative of cosine of x is equal to minus sine of x. Working with functions like sine and cosine is more complex than with polynomials. However, we can express these functions as infinite sums of powers of x, known as Taylor series. Let's assume that sine of x can be expressed as an infinite polynomial. We can find the first term of this series by plugging in 0 for x. We get sine of 0 on the left side, which is equal to 0. On the right side, we are left with only a, because the other terms become 0. So a must be equal to 0. Now we calculate the derivatives of both sides. Since the original functions are equal, their derivatives must also be equal. The derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. Using the constant, sum and power rules, we can find the derivative of the right side. Now we set x to 0 again, and we know that b is equal to 1. Now we repeat this process again and again. And that gives us all coefficients. The denominators of the coefficients can be written as factorials of the odd numbers. We can use the same method to find the Taylor series for cosine of x. To understand the concept of number e, let's look at exponential functions. For example, f of x equal to 2 to the power of x. Since this isn't a polynomial, we have to use the definition to find its derivative. The derivative of this function is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of 2 to the power of x plus h minus 2 to the power of x divided by h. We can write 2 to the power of x plus h as 2 to the power of x times 2 to the power of h. Now we can factor out 2 to the power of x. When we make h smaller and smaller, we find that this limit approaches a number around 0.69. Let's do the same thing for 3 to the power of x. The derivative ends up being 3 to the power of x times around 1.1. For 2 and a half to the power of x, the derivative is 2.5 to the power of x times around 0.91. Now, imagine we find a special number for which this part is equal to 1. 
Let's call this number e. It means that the derivative of e to the power of x is equal to e to the power of x times 1. So this function is its own derivative. Now we only know that e is bigger than 2.5 and smaller than 3. There are many ways to calculate the value of e. But first, let's find a Taylor series for the function e to the power of x. We will use the same method as we used to find the Taylor series for sine of x and cosine of x. We start by setting x to 0. This shows that the first coefficient is equal to 1. Next, we take the derivatives of both sides of the equation. The left side, the derivative of e to the power of x, is straightforward because e to the power of x is its own derivative. For the right side, we use the constant sum and power rules. Then we set x to 0 again and we find that b is equal to 1. We repeat this process multiple times to calculate more coefficients. This gives us the Taylor series for e to the power of x. To find the value of e itself, we can plug in 1 for x in the Taylor series and sum the terms. After summing the first 7 terms of this series, we find that e is approximately equal to 2.718. To understand Euler's identity, let's go back to the Taylor series for sine of x and cosine of x. The sum of the Taylor series for sine of x and cosine of x is similar to that of e to the x, but the signs are different. But there is a number that we can multiply x by to make the signs match. This number is i. Instead of e to the power of x, we can consider e to the power of i times x. i times x to the power of 2 is equal to minus x squared. The third power gives us minus i times x cubed. The fourth, x to the power of 4. And so on. Now the signs match, but some of the terms are multiplied by i. Those terms are exactly the terms of the sine Taylor series. So to make them equal, we can just multiply the sine of x by i. Now we know that the Taylor series for e to the power of x is equal to the sum of the Taylor series of cosine of x and sine of x multiplied by i. And it tells us that e to the power of i times x is equal to the cosine of x plus i times the sine of x. Now, when we plug in pi for x, on the right side, we get cosine of pi plus i times the sine of pi. Cosine of pi is equal to minus 1 and sine of pi is equal to 0. So on the right side, we are left with just minus 1. We can move the minus 1 to the right side of the equation. And that is Euler's identity. e to the power of i times pi plus 1 is equal to 0.